All right. So uh, good uh, evening, everyone in uh, Malaysia. So uh, thank you for joining me today. So today, basically, we're going to talk about the role of echocardiography in severe aortic stenosis. Um, so I will just give you some tips and tricks on how to deal with um, low gradient severe aortic stenosis and also just a normal aortic stenosis and a few examples of how to deal with uh, this uh, diagnosis. Now, Whenever, for example, we as a doctor or even as a CVT, we uh, see a report of someone with aortic stenosis or even when we are doing the procedure uh, in a patient with aortic stenosis, the first thing that we always have to remember is measurement, measurement and measurement. So this is very, very important when you want to uh, assess aortic stenosis. And you know continuity equation for aortic stenosis, whatever that is go into the valve through the left ventricular outflow tract is the same thing that go out through the aortic valve. Okay, so flow to the left ventricular outflow tract is the same as flow outside the aortic valve. So the question will be like this. Okay, so the top one is the flow into the left ventricular outflow tract, which is LVOT surface area times LVOT velocity time integral equal to aortic valve area times aortic valve velocity time integral. Now aortic valve area, we just rearrange the equation is equal to LVOT surface area times LVOT VTI over aortic valve VTI. Okay. Now, the most important parameters in this is actually every, every one of them. All of them are important. Okay. But the one where it is most easy to make a mistake is when you calculate the LVOT surface area because the LVOT surface area is pi R squared. So any error in measuring the radius, you will square the error. Okay, that is very important. It's easily make mistake. However, the one that is most important to get correct during measurement is actually the LVOT VTI and aortic valve VTI. Why is that so? So that is very important because the only way that you can get that correct is in the lab. So once the patient go out of the lab and see a doctor review the report uh, in his or her clinic, he cannot correct the thing that is wrong with LVOT or AVVTI, that you only have one chance to correct it, okay? So how do we make sure that our LVOT, VTI and AVVTI is correct? I will, tell, I will tell you after this. However, I just wanted to propose for you, once you make sure your LVOT, VTI and AVVTI is correct, you can use this as a marker of internal consistency of the measurement, right? So let me give you an example. Let's say you get someone with severe aortic stenosis, okay? So the first thing that you do is look at the echo and make sure that LVOT, VTI and AV, VTI is correct. Now, if this is correct, okay, you know that the dimensionless index for severe aortic stenosis should be less than 0.25, okay? Now, if your dimensionless index is more than 0.25 and you know that your LVOT, VTI and AV, VTI is correct, meaning that there is something wrong in the calculation of LVOT diameter, okay? Both of them should tally, all right? So if let's say you see a patient with severe aortic stenosis and their dimensionless index is more than 0 0.25, it means that there's something wrong with the LVOT diameter, okay? So you have to make sure that it's correct first. Let's see, I give you another example. You got someone with low gradient severe aortic stenosis. What do you do first? What I do first is I make sure my LVOT, VTI and AV, VTI is correct. If this is incorrect, the whole equation will break down. So you have to correct that one first. If this is correct, you can hold the LVOT, VTI and AV, VTI as your internal consistency check. So in your low gradient severe aortic stenosis, your LVOT, VTI and OV, VTI should be less than 0 0.25. See, the dimensionless index has always to be tallied with aortic valve area. Now, let's say you have low gradient severe aortic stenosis, but your dimensionless index is more than 0.25, meaning that there is something wrong with your LVOT diameter, okay? Only when everything is tallied, then you can decide whether to accept or not to accept whatever the conclusion is, okay? So that is very important. After you got all that, one of the most important thing is to calculate stroke volume index. Okay, so this is to determine whether your patient have a normal flow. So normal flow is between 25 mils per meter squared to 36, 36, 65 mils per meter squared. 
or is it low flow, less than 35, or is it high flow, more than 65? And then after that, you calculate the ejection fraction. Okay, I hope you all understand this. If you don't understand about the measurements, I will repeat it during the question and answer session. So this is an example of LVOTVTI. You see, this is an example of LVOTVTI. So how do we know that our LVOTVTI is correct? So number one, when you look at the LVOTVTI, make sure that most of the inside of the LVOTVTI doctor is actually a duct shape. Okay, it is a duct because you're only looking at a single blood cell. Okay, so if you have sort spectral broadening like this, and there's a lot of white thing like that, that is usually meaning that the measurement of LVOTVTI is too close to the ioting valve. Okay, another thing that you want to try to avoid is to try to avoid this line here. This is an aortic closure line. So when you see an aortic closure line, it means that you are too close to aortic valve as well. Just go back maybe one or two millimeter, okay? So make sure it is like this, it is crisp, okay? And it's just almost one line and in the middle is dark. So that is your correct LVOTVTI, right? So that's how you make sure your LVOTVTI is correct. How do I make sure that my aortic Doppler is correct? You have to remember that you have to get the highest Doppler possible. Therefore, just to get a one measure of LV or, uh, aortic Doppler, it is not okay. It is not correct. You can never make sure that you have a correct one. So you always have to do a right parasternal Doppler measurement. Okay. In Mayo Clinic, all of the echocardiogram for aortic stenosis have right parasternal Doppler. Otherwise, you can never know whether your aortic valve VTI is correct or not. Okay. So that is how you make sure your LVOT and LV VTI is correct. So they get, you get have something to hold on in terms of your internal consistency. All right. So that is this. Try to avoid measuring when the closing click is visible. The flow must be laminar with minimal spectral broadening. And if you look at the aortic valve Doppler here, you can actually see the LVOT Doppler inside here. That is not good. So that means is the measurement of aortic valve Doppler is too near to the LVOT. So you have to get clear nearer to the aortic valve in this situation. Okay. So this is the most important. So when I measure the DVI correctly, I can use this as an internal check of measurement consistency. If my DVI tally with effective orifice area, I accept the conclusion. If my DVI don't tally with EOA, I don't accept the conclusion. Okay, I will look at my LVOT diameter, whether it is correct or not, because I already make sure my DVI is correct. Now, if DVI is not correct, the whole equation breaks down. Okay, so you have to correct the DVI first. What is the classification of aortic stenosis? All right, so basically aortic stenosis, when we get a results, it behaves three classification. Okay, so the classification are area gradient match. This is when everything makes sense, okay? So your AVA is less than one, your mean gradient is more than 40, you have a straightforward severe aortic stenosis. So you don't worry about this. This patient, if they are symptomatic, they actually go for surgery, okay? Other example of area gradient match is someone with moderate aortic stenosis. So AVA is more than one, mean gradient is less than 40, that is fine. That is just moderate aortic stenosis. You just follow them up, them up. okay? That is straightforward. What about reverse area gradient mismatch? This is rarer than area gradient mismatch. This is when your gradient is high, but at the same time, your IT buff area is also more than one. That doesn't make sense because IT buff area that is less than one equal to mean gradient more than 40, but something is strong here. Why the gradient is actually high, but the IT buff area is also big. So the reason is, Number one is someone that is very big, so someone that is obese. So what happened in someone that is obese? So in someone that is obese, even though the aortic valve area is more than one, because his body is big, okay, he need more cardiac output through that aortic valve. So even aortic valve that is maybe 1.1 or 1.2 centimeter is severe for that particular person, because that 1.1 and 1.2 centimeter is not good enough to sustain the cardiac output for that patient. Therefore, the gradient is high. So that is one of the reason. What are the reasons of reverse area gradient mismatch? High flow state, so someone with concomitant severe IT regurgitation. So even though IT valve area is big, because there is a lot of flow across the IT valve, therefore the gradient is high. So another classic example, someone that, for example, you create an AV fistula for dialysis, but 
they finally don't go for dialysis and then every fistula left. So you have a high flow. Another example is someone with thyrotoxicosis and someone with anemia. Okay. The last one, which is something that I, I believe is new, is eccentric jet. So this is quite rare. But if you have a certain example of Bacchus-Pick valve, if let's say the flow through the Bacchus-Pick valve is actually very eccentric and actually hit the jet of the hit the wall of the uh, aortic uh, vessel. So what happened is this eccentric jet actually increased the gradient artificially. So you have high gradient even though your aortic valve area is big. Okay, so this is four state where you can have reverse area gradient mismatch. In this kind of situation, it's better for you to look at planimetry. Okay, if you're suspicious, you look at the IIT valve planimetry, it seems big. How come I get the mean gradient that is more than 40 always think about this kind of condition, reverse area gradient mismatch. In fact, for eccentric jet, there will even be a situation where the IIT valve area is less than one and mean gradient is more than 40, but that's actually artificially wrong meaning that the patient actually have only moderate aortic stenosis, but the eccentric jet actually made you get to the wrong conclusion. What about area gradient mismatch? Oh, so this is the one that is more common. This is when you're talking about low gradient, okay? So in area gradient mismatch, we can actually have classical low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. For example, when you get an echo report, let's say the mean gradient is 30, but the aortic valve area is less than one. Okay, so the aortic valve area is severe, but the mean gradient is less than 30. So what do you do want, you want to do first? Number one, check the dimensionless index. Is your LV or TVTI and AVVTI correct or not? If that is not correct, correct it. If is it correct, then compare your LV or T dimension, the dimensionless index to your aortic valve area. In low gradient severe AS, it should be the same. The DVI should be less than 0.25. The IT valve area should be less than 1. If it's wrong, then reject the classical low flow, low gradient severe AS. Maybe there's something wrong with your LVOT diameter. Okay, once everything you have checked is correct and you accept that this is classical, classical low flow, low gradient severe AS, number one, check the stroke volume. In low flow, low gradient, stroke volume must be less than 35 mils per meter squared. Number two, check the ejection fraction. By definition, classical low flow, low gradient severe AS, the ejection fraction must be less than 50%. Okay, in order for you to decide then whether this is actually the valve problem, which is a true severe aortic stenosis, or this is a left ventricle problem, cardiomyopathy, you do low dose dopamine stress echo to normalize the flow. Then you can differentiate is it a true or pseudo severe aortic stenosis. Right now, the second group is paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe AS. Again, same thing. Look at your LVOT VTI and AV VTI. Is it correct or not? If it's not correct, it. if it's correct, use it as a check of internal consistency. In this case, because it's severe, the dimensions index must be less than 0 0.25 and AVA less than 1. Okay, if it's not, something is wrong with your LVOT diameter, right? If everything is correct, again, shake the stroke volume. Even in paradoxical low flow, low gradient, the flow is less than 35 mils. That's why it is low flow. We call it paradoxical because the ejection fraction is actually more than 50%. So paradoxical, EF is more than 50, low flow, stroke volume less than 35, low gradient severe AS. The classical patient is patient, usually lady, small, elderly, hypertension, left ventricular is thick and small cavity. So even though ejection fraction is very good, but the cavity is very small. So the stroke volume is low, okay? Also some other condition, for example, mitral regurgitation can cause this, diastolic dysfunction can cause this, right heart dysfunction can cause this. We also have something that is uh, confusion. Okay, so when you this is called normal flow low gradient severe AS. Okay, your gradient is low, the active valve area is less than one. You check your dimensionless index, your LVOT diameter, it is all okay. But you check stroke volume, the stroke volume is normal. All right, that is normal flow low gradient severe AS. So you don't have explanation why you have low gradient because the flow is normal. So in terms of this, if the, the expert is undecided whether this is a real entity or there is some measurement error or this is abnormal flow rate is even though normal flow we don't know yet for this situation we treat normal flow low gradient severe as as you deal with paradoxical low flow the same way right and last one 
is the opposite of reverse area gradient mismatch. This is someone with very small body surface area. It's very easy to remember. This is someone with body surface area less than 1.25 meters squared, height less than 125 centimeter, and BMI less than 22. All right. In this patient, even though the IT valve area is big, but because the, the body is very small, this is adequate for them. Okay. In oppos opposite to the big fella. This is a small person. So therefore, even though the ionic valve area is small, that's fine for them, okay? Because they don't need that bigger ionic valve anyway. Now another situation is someone with high global afterload. So global afterload is the resistance that the heart have to feel against the rest of the blood vessel. Okay, so if you are hypertensive, all right. Sometimes when you measure your ionic stenosis, you can have low gradient severe AS. If you were to give them antihypertensive medication and suddenly they become a normal severe ionic stenosis, it's like a natural dobutamine stress echo. So if someone you measure atic stenosis is low gradient severe AS, but the blood pressure is 190 over 130, if you treat the blood pressure and the blood pressure normalize, you might just straight away get straightforward severe atic stenosis. Okay, so I hope you understand the classification of atic stenosis and I will give you an example. So this is example of a left ventricular outflow tract. Okay, I just wanted you to remember, okay, when we talk about effective orifice area of aortic valve, we are talking about the effective orifice area that we measured with echocardiogram. Okay, echocardiogram measured here at distal of the aortic valve at the moment where the energy dropped the most. Okay, so if you measure effective orifice area here, you will see that the mean gradient between the LVOT and the effective orifice area, that's going to be the highest mean gradient that you can achieve. Okay, so I give you an example. Let's say your LVOT pressure is 160 millimeter mercury. If you measure here, if it's 100 millimeter mercury, meaning that the gradient drop or the mean gradient is 60. So 100, 160 minus 100, that is 60 millimeter mercury. So that's the drop that is measured by echocardiogram. Okay, now effective orifice area by echo and geometrical orifice area by planimetry is different. So the one when you look at the short axis of the aorta, especially in TEE, if you were to measure the planimetry of the aortic valve, the geometrical orifice area is not the same as EOA. Normally, this is bigger than effective orifice area. Remember that most of outcome, we use echo. So this is what we use. All right. This can be used only in exceptional circumstances, like someone with reverse area gradient mismatch. Right. So that is effective orifice area by echo. Now, I just wanted to remind you, there is also another effective orifice area that we use before the advent of echocardiogram. That is effective orifice area by catheterization. Effective orifice area by catheterization is slightly distal to effective orifice area by echo. So for example, this is EOA by echo. In front here will be EOA by catheter. All right. Now, the mean gradient for echo and the mean gradient for catheter should be the same. So if you measure this 160, this 100, in the catheter also the same, 160, 100. The difference should be 60, the difference should be 60, mean gradient. However, in situation where your ascending iota is small, less than three centimeter, what you measure here can be higher than what you measure here, okay? That is what we call the phenomenon of pressure recovery, okay? For example, the pressure inside LVOT is 160. When we go just distal here in echo, it dropped down to 100. So you, the difference is 160 minus 100, that is 60 millimeter mercury, okay? In patient with small iota, because here the flow is very turbulent. As they go distally, the smaller the iota, the more lamina the flow. With the more lamina the flow, the more kinetic energy is recovered to potential energy, all right? So your pressure here is 160, your pressure here is 100. In patient with small iota, because the flow here is small lamina, the pressure here might be 120 millimeter mercury. So the difference between LVOT pressure and the echo is 60. But the LVOT pressure and catheter pressure is actually only 40 millimeter mercury. Why? Because the pressure has recovered. So meaning you have discrepancy between effective orifice area measured by echo, which is 60, and effective orifice area measured by, uh, measured by cat, which is 40 millimeter mercury, the gradient. So that is the phenomenon of pressure recovery. 
in a patient with iota that is more than three centimeter, that the pressure recovery is not important. This is important in only in someone with pressure that is the with iota that is less than three centimeter. There's another pressure recovery because of mechanical valve that is small. We will talk about it when we talk about prosthetic valve. I hope you understand the concept of pressure recovery now. Now let's look through cases. Okay, the first cases is a straightforward area gradient match. Okay, so this is a parasternal long axis view. Okay, you can see that the iota is very calcified. So this here is non coronary and that is right coronary. Now the ASE actually recommend to measure the LV LT diameter at mid systole about five millimeter below the insertion of the leaflet. However, I think the ASE will change its guideline because a lot of people, including me, like to do just straight at the insertion of the leaflet at mid systole. At mid systole, when the valve is open, but because the valve is calcified, you can't really see. So you have to look from the ECG, okay? Mid systole when the valve is open. Why do we choose mid systole? Because at mid systole is when the LVOT is at its most circle. Okay, because we use a formula pi r squared, right? So I used to I like to use the leaflet insertion itself. Now, where to measure? You have to measure at. So this is, you shouldn't see the leaflet here. This is, should be the commissure between the NCC and LCC. Then this is RCC. Therefore, you can measure the longest distance of the LVOT diameter. Okay, the measure distance of the LVOT diameter. Therefore. What happened, we always underestimate every OT diameter, almost always, so overestimate the severity. Okay, whenever we measure LV OT diameter, the study have shown we always tend to underestimate the LV OT diameter. So don't underestimate it, right? So the patient have calcified aortic valve. So this is the patient Doppler, all right? So let's look at the, the report that we have. So the patient have AV VTI of 117 centimeter, LV OT VTI of 21.3, the dimensionless index is 0.18, IOT valve area is 0.6, and mean gradient is 44.4. Okay. Now, as a reader of ECHO, you get the report, right? So this is straightforward severe IOT stenosis. Fine. However, I still want to check whether every measurement is done correctly. So I go and check check the IOT Doppler. I'm satisfied that the Doppler is done at multiple places. I check the LVOT VTI. I satisfied that LVOT LVOT VTI is done at the correct place. Therefore, I know my dimensionless index must be correct. So I compare. If my dimensionless index is correct, it should be less than 0 0.25 because my area is less than 1. So this one you can see is stellate. The DI is less than 0 0.25. I think valve area is less than 1. So meaning that there is nothing wrong with my LVOT diameter. I accept that this is a simple high gradient severe I think stenosis because it's stellate. Okay. So when we look at our classification, where do you think it, it goes into? So this is someone with mean gradient that is more than 40. I think valve area that is less than one. We have exclude the measurement error. This is area gradient match. If the patient has symptoms, the patient can go either for surgery or transcatheter. Remember transcatheter now is already indicated even for low risk patient, right? Let's look at another case. This is a case of area gradient mismatch. Again, you can see this is parasternal long axis view. You can see that the valve is very calcified. That's anterior mitral valve leaflet, posterior, non coronary cast, and right coronary cast. This is, I'm trying to measure the LVOT. All right. Remember, I usually like to measure from the insertion of this leaflet to the insertion of this leaflet. I probably want to go a bit further than that. I think that is a bit too small. All right. So you can look at short axis view. There is three casts. How to tell which cast is which? The one that is abutting the interatrial septum. So this is a non-coronary cast. That is a right ventricular outflow tract. That is right coronary and that's left coronary. In fact, you can see here the left main coming out from the left coronary. You see that? That is the left main there. So what do I do? First, I see what is the report. Okay. Now the report say that the AV VTI is 89.4. LVOT VTI is 16.2, the dimensionless index is 0 0.18, and the LVOT diameter is 2 cm. All right. Now, the calculated I think valve area is 0 0.57, and the mean gradient is 33.1. All right. And the ejection fraction is 52%. So this is low flow. So you see, the flow is low, 30 mils per meter squared, low gradient, 
severe atic stenosis and the EF is normal, 52, more than 50. So this is paradoxical low flow, low gradient, severe atic stenosis. What do I do first? What I do first is I make sure that my IATIC buff VTI and LV OT VTI is measured correctly. So I see whether this is done in multiple window. I see whether the LV OT VTI go into my satisfaction. So this is might not be so good, but we just for the sake of uh, the talk. So let's say that this is also correct. Okay. So if this is correct, this should tell it with IATIC buff area. So LV, our dimensionless index is 0 0.18. It does tell it with IATIC buff area of 0 0.57 centimeter squared. So we are happy to say that this is paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe IATIC stenosis, right? So how do we manage paradoxical low flow, low gradient IATIC stenosis? Okay. Now you already decide from your dimensionless index and it's tallied with your IATIC buff area. Okay. You already accept that this is paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe IATIC stenosis. Usually you don't do dobotamine stress echo. Okay. Because usually patient with paradoxical, paradoxical low flow, low gradient, their cavity is big, their cavity is small, and their wall is very thick. We scared that they cannot sustain adequate uh, cardiac output when we give them dobotamine stress echocardiogram. It can be done, but usually we don't do it. So the most important thing that we do is try to find whether the patient have symptoms. If they have symptoms, try to find whether the symptom is because of the aortic valve or the symptom is because of something else. If there's no other reason why the patient have symptoms, look at their calcium score, okay? The calcium score, if it's more than 3,600 for men and more than 1,600 for women, that can differentiate whether you are dealing with severe or pseudo-severe atic stenosis in patient with paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe atic stenosis, okay? Let's look at case number three. Can number three show you measurement error? Okay. So we have a 43 years old asymptomatic old man with ejection systolic murmur come for transthoracic echo. Patient was referred to surgeon, then referred for me for bicuspid aortic valve and want to assess of aorta for any coarctation. I reviewed the transthoracic echo. I don't, I'm not quite satisfied. Then I decided to proceed with transesophageal echocardiogram. Now this is echo of the patient, the ejection fraction is still fine. All right, that's the anterior wall there, that's enteroseptal, that is inferolateral wall, okay? Now, that is the IOT bar, it is calcified, all right? Now, that this is a bit difficult to measure the LVOT diameter in this situation, all right? So, it is measured in the transthoracic echocardiogram as two centimeter. Now, let's look at the Doppler. So, this is the IOT Doppler, and that is the LVOT Doppler, right? That's not enough dark thing is not dark enough in the middle here, I feel. But let's say just for the sake of uh, talk that the LVOT, VTI and IRT valve Doppler is satisfactory. So this is our measurement. Our AV VTI is 107. Our mean gradient is 32 millimeter mercury. Our LVOT VTI is 29.6 centimeter and our dimensionless index is 0 0.28. Remember that we already ascertained that our AV VTI and our LV OT VTI is correct. We already check it from the echo to say that it is done correctly. Because if it's not done correctly, we cannot proceed. We have to correct that first. Okay. The LV OT diameter is measured as two centimeter. And when we do quantity equation, our I think valve area is 0 0.89 centimeter squared. Okay. The ejection fraction is 55%. We measure the stroke volume. The stroke volume index is 58 mils per meter squared. Normal is between 35 to 65. So this is a normal stroke volume, okay? So we have a mean gradient that is 32. We have I think valve area that is 0 0.89. So we have low gradient, severe ejection, low, low gradient, severe atic stenosis, but the flow is normal. So it looks like this is normal flow, low gradient, severe atic stenosis. So remember I tell you, make sure that the dimensionless index is correct. In this situation, we know that our dimensionless index is correct. So our dimensionless index is 0 0.28. However, our dimensionless index in this time does not tally with our aortic valve area. So something must be wrong with our LVOT diameter. So this cannot be correct because it doesn't tally. Our dimensionless index that is, we already ascertained is correct. It doesn't tally with our aortic valve area. So something must be wrong with the LVOT diameter. This cannot be severe aortic stenosis. All right. So what do we do? 
at first we thought that this is low area gradient mismatch right when you look at the type of area gradient mismatch we think that this is normal flow low gradient severe atic stenosis okay but think 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 back to yourself okay i already think that the dvi is correct but how come my dvi don't tell you my with my atic valve area my dvi is more than 0.25 there's something wrong with my lvot diameter okay so what we do is i do a trans esophageal echo you can see that the bicuspid atic valve all right so you can see that there is no refi so this is surface zero okay this is the eustachian valve there okay so contrary to popular opinion eustachian valve is actually not very mobile okay if you see something that is very mobile that is chiari network not eustachian valve okay so this is the aortic valve so what happened is i do a new measurement for this patient right so i use multiplanar reconstruction and to measure a new left ventricular outflow tract circular area so in this situation i get a direct lvot area is 4.32 cm squared and i straight away do a normal lvo stroke volume okay so the stroke volume now is 4.32 cm squared times lvot vti so now i update the measurement lvot diameter is now 2.4 cm when i plug this diameter in the quantity equation i get an lva of 1.25 cm squared now my lva tell you with my dimensionless index isn't it so i have a mean gradient of 32 lva vti of 1.25 and dimensionless index is 0.28 now everything has tally so all of this is consistent with moderate atic stenosis so what happened is we have changed a confusion with a normal flow low gradient severe atic stenosis the dimensionless index is not consistent we change our lv or diameter actually this patient only have moderate atic stenosis we do not do to do that do to do anything with this patient okay so a lot of confusion on the usage of dimensionless index remember dimensionless index is not used to differentiate true or pseudo severe atic stenosis in patient with low gradient we don't use dimensionless index for that okay the dimensionless index we do number one is when we don't have a reliable lvot diameter okay in which case dimensionless index that is less than 0.25 is severe atic stenosis second function which is the more important one of dimensionless index is to check the internal consistency of the measurement just like what i said just now so what is the new classification for the patient rather than normal flow low gradient severe atic stenosis the patient actually just straightforward moderate atic stenosis so we just follow up this patient okay let's look another case case number four so again we have a parastatal long axis view of someone with atic stenosis so there's nothing special there the lvot diameter is measured at 2.24 centimeter the ejection fraction is 55 percent all right so i just wanted to give you some tip the study that has been done you know when we measured for our aortic velocity about 40 percent of the time the highest velocity is get is we get from our apical view about 60 percent of the time we get it from our right parasternal view okay so it's one thing that i can recommend you you can put a normal normal ultrasound probe first and get the flow and then after that only you change to pdoff flow how to add, predict whether the highest velocity is at the right parasternal or apical so one of the study shows that if you look at the parasternal long axis look at the angle between this aortic ascending aorta and the interventricular septum look at the degree between that now if the angle is less than 115 degree meaning that it is more the, the septum is more going upwards the more maximum aortic velocity more likely at be at the right parasternal okay if it's more than 150 degree it is more likely at the apical window so something new that i want to tell you now let's look at aortic valve so this is a doppler of the aortic valve this is the lvot vti so in this situation our av vti is 97.4 our mean gradient is 34.45 our lvot vti is 20.33 our lvot diameter is 2.24 and our aortic valve area is 0.82 cm squared all right so ejection fraction is 55 percent now from first glance okay because the ejection fraction is normal and i think valve area is less than one so this look like a low gradient severe i think stenosis one tip that i wanted to give you if you cannot have the patient flow uh, stroke volume and stroke volume 
rate. Okay, what you can do is rather than the get stroke volume, you can actually get flow rate. All right. So, for example, you forget to ask the patient body surface area, so you cannot got stroke volume stroke volume uh, uh, rate. So you can get flow rate. How do you get flow rate? Flow rate is just a stroke volume divide by ejection time of the left ventricular outflow tract. Okay, normal is more than 250 mils per second. Normal, more than 250 mils per second. So in this patient, the stroke volume is 80.38 mils. The ejection time is 0 0.366 second. So the flow rate is 220 mils per second. So this is low flow. So this is someone with paradoxical low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis. However, Okay, remember I tell you I want to make sure that the LVOT VTI and the AV VTI is correct. All right. Now, I checked the aortic valve Doppler VTI and I noticed that it was not done in many windows. It's only done in one window in the apical view. Right. So that is not good. So what we do is we bring back the patient and measure also at the apical window. And it at the Right parastinal view, now you get a mean gradient of 43.1 millimeter mercury, and you also obviously get new aortic valve VTI. Okay, so all the previous cases is when AV VTI and AV OT VTI we already ascertained as correct, so we can use that as our internal consistency. In this patient, the aortic valve VTI is incorrect, so we have to correct that first. So now we get a mean gradient of 43.1 millimeter mercury when we plug in a new mean gradient and a new VTI, we get an aortic buff area of 0 0.85 centimeter squared. So what happened now? Rather than someone with paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis, because I have corrected the AV VTI, the mean gradient now is 43.1, more than 40, and aortic buff area is less than one. So rather than paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis, if you were to classify this patient again, where you will classify it, okay? So in this patient, you will classify it as having normal area gradient match. I think valve area that is less than one and mean gradient that is more than 40. So the patient can go for surgery if the patient is symptomatic, all right? Let's look at case number five. Like I show a lot of measurement error because most of the time, this is what happened. Most of the time, what we see is measurement error. So again, someone with aortic stenosis, now this is the patient parastinal long axis view. So this is the aortic valve VTI and the LVOT VTI, okay? So the LVA VTI is 66.4. The mean gradient is 28.5. LVOT VTI is 10 centimeter. LVOT diameter is 2.1. Stroke volume is 36 mils and ejection fraction is 43%. We calculate the flow rate the flow rate is 36 mils divided by 0 0.288. It is 125, so that is low. Normal is more than 150, and I think buff area is 0 0.5 centimeter squared. So the patient have low gradient, severe I think stenosis, and the EF is only 43%. So this look like classical low flow, low gradient, severe I think stenosis. Okay. In this patient, I want to make sure that the I think buff is measured properly and the LVOT is measured properly. Okay, now we have to make sure that we get a correct dimensionless index. Okay, so we need to use multiple window. So in this patient, I am not happy with this. So what happened is I do a transesophageal echocardiogram. Now when I do a transesophageal echocardiogram, what I notice is I can get a higher velocity of the aortic VTI. Okay, remember the first step is to make sure that AV and LVOTI is correct. In this patient, it is not correct. Okay, I will show you the LV VTI later. However, usually in TEE, you can measure the LVOT diameter more correctly. So I measure the LVOT diameter and I get it as 2.4 centimeter. And as usual, we underestimate the LVOT diameter. So I go to mid transesophageal five chamber view of TEE. In fact, I get a higher mean gradient of 51 millimeter mercury. So this is change in LV VTI. So in fact, when I first get the report for this echocardiogram, it is wrong from the beginning. Even the AV VTI is wrong. Okay, so I can you know, even use my dimensionless index as internal consistency check. So this patient, when we change everything, the patient have AVA of 0 0.6 centimeter and mean gradient of 52. So rather than 
low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. Okay, this patient have just a typical high gradient severe aortic stenosis, typical area gradient match. Okay, no need to do any dobotamine stress echo. All right, so I have shown you a measurement error where the DVI is correct and the problem is LVOT diameter. I have shown you a measurement error in which the one that is wrong is the LVOT or AV VTI itself. All right, now let's look to one thing that I wanted to tell you as the concept of flow rate as alternative to stroke volume index. What is stroke volume index? You measure the LVOT stroke volume, you divide by body space area. That is stroke volume index. All right. What is flow rate? Flow rate is stroke volume divided by ejection time. So they are different. Stroke volume index and flow rate is different. Depending on heart rate, people with the same stroke volume index will have different cardiac output. Another way to measure is by using flow rate. Flow rate is the volume of blood ejected per unit time. This is LVOT stroke volume divided by LVOT ejection time. So the more severe the aortic stenosis, the longer the ejection time and the lower is the flow rate. Normal flow rate is more than 250 mils per second. All right. So when we are doing DSA, what we are doing actually is we wanted to normalize the flow rate i.e. we want to know what is the effective area when the flow is normalized at 250 mils per second. All right. In patient with low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis, if we are able to normalize flow rate, we should be able to differentiate between true or severe aortic stenosis. Okay. Now, in patient with no contractile reserve, say you someone, you hunt up for DSE, all right, you give the vitamin, 5, 10, 15, 20, they still cannot augment their cardiac output enough for you to know whether this is true or pseudo-severe aortic stenosis. So what we do is we can calculate what we call projected effective orifice area. I even remember it in my hand, in my head, projected effective area, effective orifice area is effective ori area, effective orifice area at rest plus VAF compliance. So VAF compliance is the ratio of change in effective orifice area over change in flow rate times 250 minus flow rate at rest. Okay, so that is the effective orifice area assuming that flow rate is normalized. Okay, don't worry, I will show you the equation. Okay, so what happened if they say the patient does not have contractile reserve? So let's say the contractile reserve, this is a normal flow rate here. So this is where you can differentiate between true or pseudo severe aortic stenosis. In your patient, you can only increase the flow rate from here to here, not yet to 250. Okay, what can you do? So what you do is you can plug in this equation here to get the aortic valve area in the normal flow rate. So the equation is projective aortic valve area is aortic valve area at rest. So all of this is what we call V small c change in aortic valve area at peak and at rest, so you minus this and this, over change in flow rate at peak at rest, you minus this and this, so you divide that, times 250 minus flow at rest. So you remember this equation? So even in someone that do DSE, but you cannot get the answer, you can actually do projected effective orifice area. And this can even be more accurate than the dobitamine stress echo itself. All right, I wanted to give you another tips. Now, in fact, there is new study that come out, I think maybe one or two years ago, that show that in patient with low gradient severe aortic stenosis, or even in paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis, even before contemplating doing DSE, you just do their flow rate, just divide stroke volume with ejection time. Now, if this flow rate is more than 200 or 250 mils per second, you don't need to do the multiple stress echo. That effective orifice area is already their true effective area effective orifice area, even without needing to doing dobutamine stress echo. Okay, this is a new thing that we find out. Okay, if you're not sure, you can ask me later. Let's look at our thing. This is our last case. Our last case is someone with classical low flow, low gradient severe AS. The reason I put this in the last case is I wanted to just teach you all not to accept low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis willy-nilly. Okay, always query the diagnosis. Make sure the measurement is good. All right, so this is someone with again aortic stenosis, of course. All right, so that is the Doppler. Let's click. So let's say in this situation, for the sake of argument, I look at the aortic valve. I'm happy. 
with the Doppler, I look at LV or TVTI, I'm happy with that. So I know that my dimensionless index is correct. I, so we are happy with the measurement. The stroke volume in this patient is 28 mils per meter squared. The ejection fraction is 30%. The mean gradient is 16 and the I think valve area is 0 0.64. So this is classical, low flow, low gradient, severe I think stenosis. So classical, low flow, low gradient, severe I think stenosis. When I look at the dimensional index, it is less than 0 0.25. So that's good because I know my DI is correct. So it's tally in my I think valve area. So I think by that my LVOT diameter measurement is correct. So I repeat that. I look at LVOT and LVVTI, I already satisfied that this is correct. Okay, when I look at the dimensionless index, it is less than 0 0.25. Therefore, it tallied with the ionic valve area. So therefore, my measurement of LVOT diameter is most likely to be correct. Right. So this is a classical low flow, low gradient. So what do you want to do next? So this is the ejection fraction. So how to approach the patient? So there is few answer. So A, EF is poor for conservative medical management. Number two, this is critical ionic stenosis, need surgery now. Number three, dobutamine stress echo to assess contractor response. And number four, for non-active resuscitation. All right. So maybe I give you five seconds to choose. So five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. So obviously, all right. So let's see, only one. So come on. Good. So obviously the answer in this situation is dobutamine stress echocardiogram because you wanted to assess the patient contractile reserve. We wanted to know what is the effective orifice area once we normalize the flow rate, all right? So this is the aortic valve Doppler there. Okay, this is a new Doppler. If you notice there, the mean gradient has gone up to 44.4 millimeter mercury. The aortic valve area is still down at 0 0.52 centimeter squared, okay? So in this patient, the stroke volume has gone up to more than 20%. The I think valve area stay below one centimeter squared and the main area go above 40 millimeter mercury, all right? So what happened in this patient? You have proof that the patient have true severe I think stenosis. So the reason that the gradient is low is because of the valve is so tight and the heart cannot overcome the valve that is so tight. Okay, this is true severe atic stenosis, and this patient can go for operation. So why this is very important? So we know that in patient with atic stenosis, the ejection fraction that is poor before surgery will recover after surgery. This is in comparison to someone with primary, primary mitral regurgitation, in which if the ejection fraction is very poor, when you do the surgery, it might get worse. So that's the difference. So this patient needs intervention. Okay, so what's the classification for this patient? So this is patient with area gradient mismatch. This is low flow, low gradient severe atic stenosis, classical. I give the patient the vitamin stress echo and the patient has then upburn the stroke volume by 20%. The mean gradient has go up to above 40, but the atic valve area stay below one centimeter squared. So this is true severe atic stenosis and the patient will go for intervention. There is two problem when you do your dobutamine stress echo and you still cannot get an answer. Either you don't have any contractile reserve at all. So you do stress echo, the ejection fraction doesn't go up. The flow rate doesn't go up. In this situation, you can't even do projected effective orifice area because you don't have anything to compare to. So in this situation, you if, try to do flow rate even at rest. See whether it is more than 200 to 250. If it's more than 200, that is the patient EOO, EOA. You don't even need to do stress echo. Okay. If it's still low flow, what you can do is you can do calcium score, right? The other situation is when the patient has inadequate contractile reserve, okay? Or the patient has adequate reserve. So they can augment their stroke volume, but they cannot normalize their flow rate to above 250 mils per second. Now, in this situation, you can do projected effective orifice area. Remember, the equation is effective orifice area at rest plus valve compliance time 250 minus flow at rest. So this is the equation and in fact, I show you how to calculate it. So projected effective orifice area is effective orifice area at rest. So 0 0.70. So this is effective orifice area at rest plus the vena compliance. So the change in effective orifice area divided by the change in flow rate times 250 minus flow rate at rest is 0 0.97 centimeters squared. Okay. 
So this is the grading for calcium score. Uh, for men, I think it's 2,600 now, and for female, it's 1,600. Okay, if let's say you, you, you have paradoxical low flow, low gradient, or someone that does not have contractile reserve. One tip that you can use to see whether your LVOT diameter is correct or not. So there is actually an equation to look for your LVOT diameter using this equation, which is 5.7 times body surface area plus 12.1. So if your LVOT diameter is far away from this predicted LVOT diameter, so maybe your LVOT diameter is wrong, right? Okay, so that we are almost finished now. However, with the advance of TAVA, you know TAVA is transcatheter aortic valve replacement. TAVA patients can go back within one or two days. They have better mortality, better survival. They have better stroke rate. They have better incidence of atrial fibrillation. They have better everything other than the incidence of pacemaker, even in the low risk patient. So you know that TAVA is a low risk procedure apply to a low risk patient, okay? And usually in elderly, you have to remember that TAVA study usually recruit patient more than 75 years old. I think only about 7% of patient in TAVA study is less than 65 years old. So people start doing studies. Do you really need to wait until symptoms or not to intervene for patient with severe aortic stenosis? So there is two paper that's quite easy to remember. It's by Kang and Kim. One in is New England Journal of Medicine. Another one is in Jack that show that in patient with severe aortic stenosis, early surgery actually save life, even without waiting for symptoms. And this is in Jack, also the same. If you do aortic valve replacement before the patient having symptoms, the incidence of cardiac less is less than if the patient have symptoms. So maybe in the future, we don't even need for to wait until symptoms, all right? But lastly, this is the thing that might make the argument or the understanding of low gradient severe aortic stenosis mode or even dobotomy stress echo mode. All right. So this is a study I think published in Australia. This is in Jack in 2019. You look at this and this is very, very surprising. This pearl line here is someone with moderate aortic stenosis. As you can see as here, the outcome or the survival of someone with moderate aortic stenosis is as bad as patient with severe aortic stenosis. In fact, even if you have mild, the outcome is worse than if you don't have any aortic stenosis. So this show that is this have come to a time that we need to intervene for moderate, no moderate aortic stenosis, especially using TAVA. Because if we can intervene now for moderate aortic stenosis, we don't even need to worry about low gradient severe aortic stenosis anymore. Because in essence, all low gradient severe aortic stenosis is at least moderate aortic stenosis. That's something to think about. And this is paper, this is by poster, so I couldn't get the paper by Amanullah at ATCT in 2020. It shows that all moderate aortic stenosis is not the same. So you have maybe have to stratify the moderate aortic stenosis according to stages because these different stages of moderate aortic stenosis behave differently. So one day, even if someone have moderate aortic stenosis and you stage their cardiac damage, a certain type of patient might go for surgery even only having moderate aortic stenosis. So this is my last slides, guys. So remember, measurement, measurement, measurement. Check your LVOT and AVBTI. Make sure it is correct. If it's not correct, correct it. Otherwise, the equation will break down. If it's correct, compare to your aortic valve area. Okay? If you're dealing with severe aortic stenosis, so say your aortic valve area is less than 1 and your DI is more than 0 0.25, there is something wrong with your LVOT diameter. Correct your LVOT diameter. You likely is dealing just with moderate aortic stenosis. Okay, someone with low gradient severe aortic stenosis, you make sure the DI is correct. That the muscular index show more than 0 0.25. Something wrong with LVOT diameter. This is not low gradient AS. This might be more likely just a moderate aortic stenosis. All right. This can only be guided when the measurement is correct. If the DI is accurate, can use as internal check. Remember to calculate stroke volume index. This is stroke volume divided by body surface area. Think about the concept of flow rate, which is a stroke volume divided by injection time. Normal is above 250 mils per second. If you can, try to remember that there is this thing called projected effective orifice area. If let's say you are, I don't know, some of you in private or even in you are in IJN or wherever, you see a patient with low gradient severe aortic stenosis, at the very least, just calculate their flow rate at rest. If their flow rate at rest is more than 200 and 250, maybe that is 
their effective orifice area. Don't even need to do the vitamin stress echo. Only if everything is correct, then you can accept whether this is a normal, straightforward atic stenosis, or is this area gradient mismatch or reverse area gradient mismatch. The advent of TAVI, meaning that we are more and more aggressive now in terms of treating patients with severe atic stenosis. Okay, so even someone with no catheter reserve, the procedure is still indicated. Now, thank you very much for your attention. I really hope that I have cleared the confusion in terms of management of IATIC stenosis. So I thank you so much for your attention. Um, so let's see whether there's any question and I wanted to answer and give me a comment about what you think about the lecture.